10.3. Today we're going to be taking a little bit further look at parametric equations um, and specifically how it relates to calculus. So we didn't really do any calculus last time. Did you notice it? Yeah, it was all algebra. Yeah, it's all algebra stuff in a different way, but it wasn't, a cal it wasn't calculus stuff. Um, so we're going to look at this parametric equation form, this idea as it relates um, to calculus now or calculus as it relates to parametric form. So in Calc 1, we learned how to calculate the slope of equations like y equal f of x, right? derivatives and so forth. So today we're going to do the same thing for these plane curves. So the parametric form of the derivative goes as follows. If a smooth curve C is given by the equations x equals f of t and g, y equals g of t, then the slope of that particular point C at xy is dy dx, which is the derivative of y over the derivative of x. And that should seem like it makes good sense, right? dy dx, I've got x prime, um, I'm sorry, y prime on top, x prime on bottom, all looks good. Things get a little different when we do the second derivative, though. So the second derivative of y with respect to x twice, right, that's how we read this, is that we take the derivative of the dy dx. So if we were to take the derivative of this, we're going to end up with a quotient rule, right? And this is how it actually ends up simplifying down. You will have the derivative with respect to t of dy dx divided by the derivative of x with respect to t. All right, let's try an example. Um, so we have um, to find dy dx. Our curve is x equals t squared and y equals 7 minus 6t. So we're going to find x prime of t to be what? 2t. 2t, thank you very much. And y prime of t to be what? Negative 6. And the, the definition or the statement that we had on the previous slide for dy dx said that it's going to be y prime of t over x prime of t. And so we're going to end up getting negative 6 over 2t will reduce, and it's negative 3 over t. So this is the derivative for this plane curve. Straightforward enough, right? Derivatives aren't the part that's confusing. It's the second derivatives that are a little bit more difficult to work with. Right, as evidenced by what we described on the previous slide, obviously. So the next one's actually going to have us do both then. So we're going to find dy dx, and then we're going to find the second derivative with, of y with respect to x twice. We're going to find the second derivative. Um, and we're going to do it, it says, find the slope concavity um, at the given parametric value. So we're going to do this specifically with a t equals pi over 4 plugged in at the end of each of those steps. Okay. You don't plug it in and then find the second derivative, though. We've talked about that before. You have to find the second derivative first, and then you can plug it into both of them. So first, let's get some simple first derivatives. So what's the derivative, x prime of t, of cosine 2t? Negative 2 negative, negative two sine. You get all the pieces in there. They're negative 2 sine 2t. Good. And how about the second derivative of y? I'm sorry, the derivative of y with respect to t. t. Okay, does everybody agree with that? Does that look good? Okay, so let's find dy dx, and it will be found. I won't write out the formula for since we already did it. Um, we'll take the derivative of y, so that's 4 cosine 4t, and divide it by the derivative of x, which is negative 2 sine of 2t. Um, some of this simplifies, right, the 2 and the 4. So we're going to have a 2 on top. Um, we have 2 cosine of 4t over the sine of 2t. A few reminders from an algebra trig standpoint. Um, we can't just combine those into a, a tangent or a cotangent because they have different angles. Everybody see that? There are double angle trig formulas that we could use to simplify that and combine it potentially. We're not doing that. That's not the expectation. So are there other ways to clean this up? Yes, but they're not the simple things that you might sort of wish they were. Yes, sir. I did. Thank you. Let's put one back in. Okay, so here's our derivative. Uh, but we're supposed to find a second derivative as well. So 
I need to see this a little higher up to be able to follow along my work. All right, so with our second derivative, we're going to, we'll come back and we'll evaluate this at the end. With our second derivative um, of y with respect to x twice, we want to find the derivative, I haven't written this one out again, so I will, derivative with respect to t of dy dt. And then I need, um, I don't think that's supposed to say dt, I think it's supposed to say dx. And that's what my notes say, it's just in the wrong spot there. That should say dx. And then on the bottom, it's dx dt. Okay, well, you already know dx dt. We already found it. dx dt, or x prime of t, is negative 2 sine 2t. Two That's going to go on the bottom right here. Okay? But the part here at the top means I need to take the derivative with respect to t of dy dx, which was what we just found here. So I need the derivative of this with respect to t to be in the numerator of my second derivative. So we're going to have a quotient rule. So we need to do the quotient rule with 2 cosine of 4t over sine of 2t. Let's just pick to put our negative back in the denominator where it was before just so I have a place to put it. Um, but feel free to put it up in the numerator if you wish. All right, so we need the derivative. So it's low d high minus high d low. So the low would be negative sine 2t minus the derivative of what's on top. So what's uh, going to be the derivative of what's on top? What I have, there we go. What's the derivative of 2 cosine 4t, in other words? It'll have an 8. Derivative of cosine would be sine, right? And negative of 4t. Did we get all the pieces in there right? We got two negatives going on that are canceling out later. We're going to subtract. And then we're going to do the um, okay, it's high. So the high next. So that's 2 cosine of 4t. And I need the derivative of what's on bottom. So what's the derivative of negative sine of 2t? Negative sine of 2t. Uh, it'll be negative 2 cosine of 2t. Why would it be negative? It shouldn't be. Oh, it's negative because I put my negative in the bottom. Oh. Yeah, that's why mine's negative. The derivative itself was not negative. The negative's coming down from the formula. Yeah. If you put your signs in the top instead of the bottom, your signs are flipped right now, but they'll all wash out in a minute. Well, it'll all be fine. Uh, and then we're going to divide by the denominator squared. So the denominator is negative sine of 2t. We're going to square it, so that negative is actually going to cancel in a moment. And it's all over dx dt, which was negative 2 sine 2t. Two Isn't that lovely? Yeah, it's, it's kind of a mess. Um, let me change my pen stroke to a little bit smaller so I can write a little bit more condensed. Uh, some of these things simplify and cancel out really nice, right? Like, so here's a negative and a negative. Have these two negatives. So I should have positives across the top. Um, and then this bottom denominator uh, right here will actually end up being positive as well because I'm squaring it. But I have a negative in my final denominator. So if you switched your negatives on top, you got both pieces right now negative, but you have a positive on bottom. So that's the compensation that's going to take place. So it's going to be okay. Mm -hmm. um, and then, um, let's see. We're going to have 8 sine of 2t, sine of 4t, plus 4 cosine of 4t, cosine of 2t. And then my denominator is going to be squared from here, right? And then I'm going to move this into the denominator here as well. Right, is multiply by the reciprocal, it'll join the denominator that's already there. So I'm going to have sine squared of 2t, and then I have a negative 2, so I'm going to put it at the beginning, negative 2, and another sine of 2t, which really means I'm going to have sine cubed of 2t on bottom. So I think, hang on a second, let me shift this over and put the 3 there, and then we'll address the question. Um, so what I'm doing is I'm multiplying by the reciprocal, 1 over negative 2 sine 2t. Two Stuff over here, whatever. Uh, these cancel, so that's how it's moving. So it's moving up here to here. Nice, isn't it? It's just beautiful. It's fantastic. Um, it's as simple as it's going to get for what we're doing. We're not, we don't have... I shouldn't say we don't have. 
we're not going to take the time to worry with some angles, um, you know, some angle formulas like from trig or double angle formulas from trig to change the version of this at all. If there is something that we could simplify, we would. I don't have a sine 2t. I have one here, right, in the numerator, but not on this piece, so I can't reduce those. I would want to, I will reduce my 2 and my 4 and my 8. I guess I'll do that. Uh, and if you wanted to move the negative up, you could. So leave the negative at the bottom, move it up. But the 2s and the 4s and 8s can be simplified. That's it. Adrian? So what was the dx over dt? What, what was the dt again? I missed that. The dx dt? Yeah. It's this, this is the same as x prime. Okay, and why is it divided then by negative 2 sine over 2t? That's part of the formula. Like the formula for finding dx, or for finding d2y dx2 is to, to, to divide by the dx dt. It, it was what we were given over here. Okay. And it comes from doing the quotient rule. I mean, that's where it's coming from. But, yeah. All right. We'll do the one cleanup step with all of the um, coefficients reducing. And if we reduce all our coefficients, we are going to get 4, I'll leave, I'm going to leave my negative on bottom, 4 sine 2t sine 4t plus 2 cosine, I'm going to put my 2t in front, cosine 4t, you don't have to, but it's kind of nice, uh, and then negative sine cube 2t. So this is d2y dx2. And up here was my dy dx. Okay, so those are the two answers they asked for first. And then they said at the given parametric values. So we're going to actually evaluate this then at pi over 4. Uh, and a lot of these values, in fact, all of them are going to be at least somewhat friendly. I don't have space over there to do it. All right, so we're going to come back up. Let me see here. We're going to come back up here, and we're going to evaluate this at t equal pi over 4. So if I put pi over 4 in, I've got 2 cosine of pi divided by negative sine of pi over 2. So I'm putting it in and reducing as I go. I'm pretty good with that. Um, all right, what is the cosine of pi? negative 1. So I have a 2 in the top and a negative 1. And what is the sine of pi halves? It's 1. So I've got the negative on bottom and then I've got a 1 here. So if I reduce this, I'm going to get 2. Thank you. So our slope is actually the number 2. This is our slope. Or you can write dy dx um, at, x, at t equals 2. Uh, the other one then I'm definitely need more space, so I'm going to shift it. I'm still on screen. Good. Uh, we're going to evaluate this one at pi over 4, right? So we're going to have d2y dx2. And let's see, I have 4 sine of pi over 2. And then sine of pi plus 2. And I have cosine of pi over 2 and cosine of pi. And on the bottom, I have negative sine cubed of, so sine cubed, I'll put the cube on the outside in a second, um, 2 times pi, so pi over 2 cubed. Do I have all the pieces in there? Did I get them all in there right? I think I did. Um, I'm going to write above them what they are, and then we'll simplify. So what is the sine of pi halves? That one's one. What's the sine of pi? Zero. Down zero. So this whole thing's zero. Not negative zero. It's just zero. How about the cosine of pi over two? What is that one? That one's zero as well. And just for good measure, cosine of pi would be would be one. Um, it's it worth? Okay, so the whole entire numerator is zero. Agreed? Okay. It is worth noting that we still need to double check the denominator because if the denominator is zero, we do have a problem, right? Uh, we want to double check that. So on the denominator, what is the sine of pi over two? 
that one actually is one. So this is a one on bottom. So I do actually end up getting zero over, and it's technically negative one because there's a negative down here, but that's gonna give me zero. So my slope is zero. So what does it mean to have, it? somebody said it. The concavity is zero. So what does it mean for the concavity to be zero? Okay. What is the slope doing if it's not increasing or decreasing? Okay, it's not necessarily a constant. It could be, but something else could be happening or potentially happening. No. That's if we had the derivative of zero. If the derivative were zero, we would have a max or a min. What's the possibility if the second derivative is zero? Points of inflection. Thank you, Brayden. You got it. So there's a potential point of inflection here. There didn't have to be a point of inflection, but there might be a point of inflection here as in a change in concavity, right? So I'm just going to note that for you as a reminder. This might change concavity. So we've seen graphs that do both. For example, if you have y equals x cubed, it actually has a slope or a point of inflection right there, but the concavity uh, and the concavity does change, right? Um, but if you had y equals x to the fourth, which is kind of a flatter than normal looking parabola, it also has a second derivative of zero here, but it, it doesn't change concavity. So you could have a change in concavity, you don't have to, but it's a possibility. All right, all that work for a number two and a number zero, or negative, yeah, a, ne a two and a zero, all that work. Yeah, if you had had a positive number for your concavity, it would actually mean that you would have it be concave up, so it would be opening upwards, and a negative would be concave down. Yeah. All right, we're going to take a look um, at some more problems. Um, this one asks us uh, to find an equation of a tangent line at a given point on the curve. We've done that before, but not for a parametric, right? Finding tangent lines. So the first thing we're going to actually find is we're going to find the slope, and we're going to use what we just learned to do that. So we're going to find, um, I'll use the same notation, x prime of t and y prime of t. So what is x prime of t? Mm -hmm. And what is y prime of t? Plus one. Okay, good. So those are our derivatives. And if we want to find dy dx, then we'll take the y, which was 3t squared plus 1, and divide it by the x, which is 4t cubed. Um, they're wanting us to do this specifically on a at the point 2, 0, and on b at the point 3, negative 2. So they give us an x and a y, but our dy dx is in terms of t. So how do we use this dy dx and this point together? What's that? Plug it in where, Sophia? Yeah, the x equation and the y equation, when plugged into those, we should be able to figure out what the t value is, correct? So if we take these and we put them in for x, so x is 2. So 2 equals t to the 4th plus 2, and y is 0, so 0 equals t to the 3rd plus t. We have to find a t value that satisfies both equations simultaneously. Can you tell what t value does that by looking? Yeah, it's 0. So if you can't see it by looking, you're going to do some simple, you know, like algebra stuff, move some things around and solve for it. Um, that works really well. Um, on both of them to do that. Um, you do need to keep in mind, like on the second one, for example, since there's t's in both locations, you'd need to factor and not just shift it and start dividing things out with variables. We don't do that. Um, but this is going to yield t equals 0, which means my dy dx will be evaluated, actually I'll write it this way, at t equals 0. So we're going to do this as 3t squared, or 3 0 squared plus 1, over 4 to the 0, it's 4 times 0 cubed. What happens? Somebody about said it. Okay, so this number is undefined. An undefined graph 
is a vertical line. Is everybody good so far? But there's still a line, right? It's not no solution, right? There's still a line. It's just that it's a vertical line. And it's a vertical line still that must be going through the point that they gave us to zero. So what would the equation of that vertical line be? Okay, so vertical lines are equations x equals, x equals what? Two, because that ordered pair is an x value, has an x value of two. Let's try the next one. Um, I don't think we get a vertical line on this one, so it's more of a standard kind of thing where we're looking for. Uh, so x is three now, so if three t to the fourth, plus two, and we have, I'm gonna put the y over here because we're gonna actually have to do a little bit of solving unless you just happen to see it. Uh, negative two equals two t cubed plus t. All right, so of these two equations, the easier one to solve is actually the first one. There's only one t involved, as in it's t to the fourth, but there's only one of them. And so we can subtract the two to the other side. t to the fourth is gonna equal to one. If we take the fourth root, what's the fourth root of t? I'm uh, sorry, what's the fourth root of one? It's a plus or a minus one. We are taking an even root, so we do have the possibility that it could be a negative one as opposed to a positive one. So you can take the t equal one or the t equal negative one, plug it in and see which one works over there. That's certainly fine, you can do that, not a problem. Or you can solve this directly, which would mean moving the two to the other side and then factoring. Um, the problem with this one is that it's not t squared plus t plus two, right? Where it's quadratic and we would factor like normal, it's cubed, and that's a much more difficult question. So it's probably easier for us not to try and do any factoring and just see which of these two um, values for t actually satisfies our equation. So whether you're using the first one or the one where I moved the two, does the number one plugged in work? So is 1 cubed plus 1 plus 2 equal to 0? No, this one doesn't equal 0, right? What happens if I put in negative 1? That one actually works, right? If I do negative 1 cubed, I get a negative 1, another negative 1, and then adding my 2, I go back to 0. So that tells me my t is equal to negative 1 for what I'm working with. And that didn't solve anything. That just told me what I'm going to evaluate my derivative at. So my dy dx will be evaluated at a t value of negative one. So I'll take three, plug in negative one, square it, plus one. And four, plug in negative one and cube it. Okay, what do we have on top? Four? What's on bottom? Negative four, so I have a slope of negative one. Did everybody get negative one? Okay, so this is my slope. I'm actually gonna call it M at this point. Here's my slope, and here's a point. How do I find an equation using those two pieces of information? The point slope form. So I have y minus y1, y1 is negative two, so this is y plus two, equals M negative one times x minus um, the x1 or that three value, which is x minus three. And we will solve this. So I have negative x plus three minus two. Whoa, whoa, whoa. There we go. So my equation seems to be negative x plus one. Does that look okay? All right, so I don't have this in my notes to do this, but I feel really compelled that we should look at this on a calculator to see what it looks like um, when we, I don't know if I can do that actually, because one of them's in terms of X and one of them's in terms of Y. Well, we can at least visualize it, we can try. So let's give it a go. Take your calculator, we're gonna put the parametric equation in that they're giving us, and we're going to at least make sense in terms of the graph, if, at least see that these equations make sense in terms of the graph it draws for us. So we have t to the fourth, make sure you're in the right mode if you've been ma uh, manipulating with it in another class. So t to the fourth plus two, and then we have t cubed plus t. Um, we know we got a t value of negative one for this to work, so I at least need my t values 
to go from negative one. So I'm gonna let my window have my T minimum and say, let's go negative two to two. That might be enough. I'm leaving my T step at point one. I've got negative fives and five still from last time. We're gonna give that a try and see if that works and we're just gonna graph it. Okay, the graph that I'm seeing, let me sketch it on here on mine, is completely in quadrants one and four, and it looks like a sideways parabola. Does yours look like that? Um, okay, so at each of these T values, so it, and it started on the bottom, didn't it? It drew it from the bottom up, I think. So at T equal to two, we're at about, right, or sorry, not T equal to two, T equal to one, negative one, we're at about right here. Does a graph of negative X plus one seem reasonable if I were to draw a tangent line there? So I can't draw this in the same screen because this screen is set up in parametric and that equation's in, in function notation, right? But if I were to sketch this in, it would look something like that. I think it's reasonable, first of all, that it's a negative slope, right? And it's reasonable that it's crossing on the positive Y axis. So that's a reasonable answer. The other one was at t equal to zero. And again, if you were watching as it tracked along, the wheel, t equal zero is actually right here. Do you see a vertical line there? Yeah, it makes sense to us as we look at the graph that there was a vertical line. Now, we have to be a little bit careful that we're watching as the graph goes to see where that t equal one is probably showing up and where that t equal zero is probably showing up. Or we need to be maybe a little bit more strategic in how we choose the values or something like that. But both of these seem like reasonable um, values or lines to have gotten for what we were working with. Okay, let's try another one. This one actually asks us to find all points, if there are any, of horizontal and vertical tangency. So horizontal and vertical tangency means that they create a horizontal line as a tangent line or a vertical line as a tangent line, okay? The words themselves or the phrases themselves describe what they're doing. I'm gonna create a horizontal line or I'm going to create a vertical line. So both of those things, whether it's horizontal or it's vertical, hinge on us looking at what the slope of these things are. So we're back to still finding slope, just like we did in the previous couple of problems. So I need to find x prime of t, and what is that gonna be? 2t, and I need to find y prime of t, and that is 4t to the third minus four. And I'm supposed to be finding dy dx, so I've got 4t cubed minus 4 over 2t. Um, the most I can really do is to simplify it by dividing by 2. So I could write this as 2t cubed minus 2 over t. Everybody good so far? Okay. Now, if I'm wanting to find a slope, let's see, part A is how they did it. A is horizontal. What can you tell me about the uh, slope of a horizontal line? It's zero, right? It's a flat line, right? This is a slope of zero. Well, if this is my equation over here, 2t cubed minus 2 over t for finding slope, and I want my slope to be zero, what part of this actually needs to be zero? The top has to be zero, right? So the numerator equals zero, and in our case, that's 2t, whoops, 2t cubed minus two is equal to zero, and we can solve this, right? Sure we can. So let's add and move some things around and so forth. So I have 2t cubed equals to two. If I divide by two, I have t cubed is equal to one. What's t? One. t is one. Now, that doesn't exactly answer the question just yet, it found the t value for which this happens. But it wants us to find the points that's associated with that. So what do we do? Back into the equations for x and y, right? So we're going to find x of 1, and we're going to find y of 1. So x is t squared, so this is 1 squared minus 1. What does that give me for x? I want 0. And then I have t to the 4, so this is 1 to the 4th minus 4 times 1. What does that give me for y? That one's negative three. So it's going to have a point of horizontal tangency at zero, negative three. And we'll confirm with our calculator in a second too, just like we did a minute ago. How about vertical tangent lines? 
What do you know about the slope of vertical tangent lines or of vertical lines period? It's undefined. The slope is supposed to be undefined. How do you get an undefined slope? The denominator is zero, right? So my denominator is zero. And whether we use the original denominator or we used our denominator where we simplified, that tells us that the t is zero, correct? So my denominator is not very exciting. It's just t equals zero, or t at this point. So putting in zero means t is going to equal zero. That's not the point, though, as in the ordered pair point. I need to actually find that by using the equation. So I need x of zero and y of zero. Okay, so x of zero would be uh, zero squared minus one, which would give me negative one. And then y of zero is zero to the fourth minus four times zero, which gives me zero. So this point of vertical tangency is the point negative one, zero. So let's grab a calculator. Go ahead and put that parametric um, system in there. So we have t squared minus one and t to the fourth minus four t. Um, we need to at least have t values that are zero and, and one, but my negative two to two from a minute ago does that. Um, I'm gonna leave my graph the same. So t minimum is zero, negative two, t maximum is two, and then negative five and five for x and y, and we'll see if that looks okay. It's a very interesting graph, not at all like the last one we did. Um, it has a very interesting shape. It looks something like that-ish, does yours too? All right, so let's find those ordered pairs on your graph and I'll try to plot them on mine. So one of them was supposed to be at zero, negative three. So zero, negative three was down here. Do I have a point of horizontal tangency there? I do. It looks like there's a horizontal line if I were to try to find the slope or the tangent line there, right? And then the other one was at the point negative one, zero. And negative one, zero appears to be there. I mean, negative one, zero. Um, my graph's not perfect, but yours looks better in your calculator, I'm sure, just like mine. Does it look like that seems reasonable that there's a line of vertical tangency there? Yeah. So your graph should be able to confirm what, you, what your algebra and calculus are telling you. All right. Next one, and this one's an application of the concavity questions that we were looking at before, actually. This one says to determine the open T intervals on which the curve is concave up or concave down. Okay, so concavity is all about second derivatives, right? We go to second derivatives to do that, but we have to pass through first derivatives, of course, first. What is the derivative of 2t plus natural log of t? These are our first non-polynomials today. 2 plus 1 over t, excellent. Um, I'm going to rewrite that because I'm going to need it in a moment rewritten anyway, so I'm going to write that as t to the negative 1. Um, y prime, what's the derivative of y? Same thing, but negative, right? So 2 minus 1 over t, which is 2 minus t to the negative 1. Everybody good with that? Okay. Um, maybe I didn't need to rewrite them. I don't know. Um, let's see, dy dx. Um, so the y on top, 2 minus, let me leave them written in fractional form. 1 over t, or yeah, and then 2 plus 1 over t. Um, if we multiply by t, that'll clean up better probably than what I was thinking. So 2t minus 1 over 2t plus 1. That's my derivative. Okay, is everyone okay with that? Um, I do need to find the second derivative of that quantity. So if I find the second derivative of that and I divide it by the original of the x prime of t, so that would be my dy dx. So d2y dx2. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the denominator and it's gonna be rewritten as the original x denominator. So two plus one over t. That's my original x prime denominator. And then I need the derivative of this two t minus one over two t plus one which is obviously using a quotient rule. So I have the denominator, so 2t plus 1, times the derivative of the numerator, which is 2, 
minus the numerator, which is 2t minus 1, times the derivative of the denominator, which is another 2, all over 2t minus, I'm sorry, is it minus? Plus, thank you, 2t plus 1, and then squared. I think I've got all the pieces in. Uh, some things in the numerator are going to clean up pretty nicely. Um, I do still have this complex fraction business going on that's not, not really fantastic um, that we'll need to clean up as well. Um, but let's see, the numerator first. So 4t plus 2 minus 4t plus 2. And then over, um, and then I've got 2t plus 1 squared and then for the very same reason that I was able to move that denominator into the other denominator I can do that here again so this is 2 plus 1 over t okay all right numerator cleans up at least the four t's go away and it combines to a four so I have four over 2t plus 1 squared uh, and then I don't really like the fact that there's another t going on down here. So if I multiply this by t, by t on top and bottom, I'll get 4t on top. And then it'll distribute through here to give me 2t plus 1. And lo and behold, what happened? It's the same thing the other piece was, right? So I have 2t plus 1 actually cubed. Okay, so if I was just asked to find the second derivative, I would be done. That's not what I'm asked to find. It wants to know the intervals on which the curve is concave up or concave down. So this goes all the way back to chapter three, like a year ago stuff, okay? For some of you, at least those of you who took Calc 1 a year ago. Um, we need to set this equal to zero and find places where it actually might change concavity. So if I set this equal to zero, um, and technically also or equal to does not exist, that's another option, those will be places where it might change concavity. So clearly the 4t equals zero is going to happen at t equals zero, right? Top is zero, then the whole thing's going to be zero. Um, the way I get it to be does not exist is that the denominator is zero. What value would t need to be for my denominator to be equal to zero? Can you tell? Yeah, negative one half. So these are the two possibilities of where my concavity could change. We do need to pause here for a moment and remember what my equations were to start with. Take a look. What do you know about logs? Because they're different than polynomials. So this goes back to chapter five. When zero is infinity, negative infinity is undefined. Okay, the natural log of zero is undefined. We actually have a vertical asymptote on the graph there. What if we try to take the natural log of negative one half? That's also undefined, right? So the domain for logs is actually from zero to infinity, but it doesn't include zero. Do y'all remember that? Okay, I can't put zero and negatives into a log and have a value. So what does that mean? Well, it means it's not gonna change concavity. These are the only two places where it could have, and it doesn't happen. Now that still doesn't completely answer our question. We do still need to know, is it concave up or concave down? But at the very least, it tells us that it's not gonna change. It's gonna be one concavity the whole time. Okay, so both of these are not in the domain. And what that means is that there's no concavity change. There's only gonna be one concavity. It's either going to be concave up or concave down. How can we figure out which one's it supposed to be? Adam, you're already telling me you know it's up. What did you do? Um, well, I know that since the double derivative is positive on both top and bottom, that no matter what the um, result will be positive, so then the concavity is positive, therefore positive. Okay, so you're absolutely correct, but I want you to clarify for me, how do you know that this piece has positive numbers on top and bottom? What did you do to make that decision? Um, there was no negative in it, so even if you put another negative in it, it doesn't exist in the range, and then you can't get a negative out of it. Okay, so the only way for that top, let's just look at the top right now for a moment because it's the easier piece to look at. The only way for that top to be negative is if I put in a value for t that's negative, agreed? 
But what do you know about t? It can't be negative, right? Because of the original functions I was given. I can't have a negative inside of a natural log. So the only t values I can actually put in are positive numbers. And any positive number I put in on top is going to make it positive. And the same is true on bottom. We just started with the top. So in essence, you can make this decision by taking a value, any of them, in the domain, make it easy, take t equal 1, and figuring out what is the sign on the top and what is the sign on the bottom. And they are both positive. So if I evaluate this at t equal, say, 1, I'm going to get a positive over a positive, correct? That gives me a positive number. So this tells me that it's concave up on the domain, and I am going to write the domain down, it's 0 to infinity, because that's why I decided I was able to take, in this case, t equal to 1, is because it is in that domain. Okay. I think we have time to at least define the next piece, and then I'll pause. Arc length. It's very interesting because uh, the next two pieces are arc length and areas of sur a surface of revolution. And that's exactly what I did yesterday in Calc 2, um, was those two pieces. So um, we're looking at this now in terms of parametrics, though. So the arc length in parametric form. So if a smooth curve C is defined by the equations x is f of t and y is g of t, such that C does not intersect itself on the interval, so no crossing over itself, then the arc length of C over the interval is given by this equation. So we've got an antiderivative from a to b of the square root of each of the pieces squared. Kind of looks like magnitude, doesn't it? Right, magnitude, length, that should make sense. That is the connection. We are looking at something that's a magnitude and we're finding its antiderivative in order to find its length um, because it's a curve. All right, so Let's just talk through what we're going to do and then um, pause. So as we take a look at this equation, it wants us to find the arc length. These are very straightforward kinds of questions in terms of um, how we set them up. Looking back at that formula, you're supposed to have a derivative x prime and a derivative y prime. You're going to square them and you're going to add them together and then you're going to take their square root. Sometimes that cleans up and takes the square root very nicely. And this particular problem will work out that way. When it doesn't work out that way, and you can't take the square root very nicely and so forth, generally the directions will tell you, use a graphing utility to find an approximation. They're not trying to trip you up, okay? If they tell you that, it's probably because at some point you're not gonna be able to keep simplifying. All right, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pause the video here and we'll chat.